start for real now. <laughs> um, my name's Evelyn. I'm the new editor at uh, La Biotech. Um, I've only been with the company for a few months. Um, I just moved to Berlin from New York uh, in February. And um, not a moment too soon, given the results of the presidential election. Um, I'm a recovering chemist. Uh, my training was in neuropharmacology. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I'd like to say about myself. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Thomas Hanka. He's um, an executive vice president at Evotech. Um, Thomas, would you please come on stage? So uh, Thomas is uh, the head of immunology and inflammation at Evotech, as well as the head of academic partnerships. Um, Evotech is one of the biggest biotechs in Europe with over 1,000 employees on staff. Um, it's grown out of a CMO into a company that now has its own drug pipeline, and as such, it's one of the pilot companies for this sort of dual model. Um, so let's sit. Thank you. So to start off, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the company's transition from uh, services into uh, drug making? Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, you're absolutely right. I think uh, founded in 1993, Evotech has been one of the oldest German biotech companies for sure. Um, that has had in the past, I'd say, a, a varied history of, of strategic focus. Uh, started off very strongly on, uh, on uh, developing uh, novel technologies uh, suitable for high throughput, high content screening. Um, that was in the 90s, in the two, early 2000s, there was a phase where we started to develop our own CNS-focused drugs, um, which turned out to be, um, I'd say, a, a very risky business as everybody can appreciate uh, who's, who's in the business. So uh, in the year 2008, 2009, there was a decision to, to focus again on, on Evotech's core capabilities, uh, namely on its technology platforms. And there was a consolidation phase where we decided uh, to focus exclusively on our preclinical uh, drug discovery services business to, to consolidate the company. And uh, after this one, well, after a couple of years, um, we were looking for new ways to generate upside and we uh, basically realized, and that was well before my time because I joined Evotech only three years ago, um, that we have to find new ways of, of generating um, our own drug discovery pipeline. And so we started to leverage our, our, um, our technological know-how with uh, teaming up with, with academics to, to, to generate an internal pipeline. So that was about uh, five years ago and it's gone, gone fairly well since then. Okay. Um, so, but Evotech has been around for 25 years at this point, or almost 25 years, and no drugs have yet come out of the company. Um, when could we expect one? Well, we, today we have a, uh, a pipeline of about 70 partners projects, out of which Evotech is, is a driving force only in the preclinical space. Everything that goes into clinical development has been uh, out-licensed and partnered uh, with, with some of the major pharma companies, and, and we do have a number of drugs which are currently developed by our pharma partners uh, in, in, in phase one and onwards trials. So it's very difficult to say, given the attrition rates, when the first uh, drugs uh, will be on the market, where, where Evotech has basically done uh, the core, uh, core experiments, but, but, but certainly I would say we're very hopeful that this will, will be the case over the coming years. Right, okay. Um, so then at this point, since you're still uh effectively uh, getting started. Um, how, how do you go about pitching investors? Um, because uh, companies like Morphosis have half the employee count but double the market cap. So uh, what's your financial strategy? Or for how do you justify uh, huge amounts of money to them? Well, I think our, one of the key differentiators is that the way we've structured the company right now into a, a, a drug discovery fee-for-service business called Evotech Execute and the internal pipeline business called Evotech Innovate is that we have a much lower risk of failure as we're basically not putting all our eggs uh, in, in one basket, if you will. We're spreading out, uh, maybe very much like an operational VC, we're spreading out uh, our risk into a, a, a broad number of projects and so we focus on our preclinical part. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and we're only investing the margin that we obtain from our, our service business. So in other words, we, were, we are a company that has been profitable for the last years. We're looking forward to maintaining profitability. We're also generating an upside from the internal drug discovery pipeline. And I think as such, we have a very different risk profile if you compare it with uh, companies such as Morphosis, other companies which are really uh, now more and more zooming in on 
on clinically developing their front-running compounds such as MOR28. I see. Okay. Um, and part of that preclinical focus uh, is what led you to academic partnerships. Um, so uh, you recently started, or at least Evotech recently started Lab 282, which is um, it's sort of a proving ground for uh, bridging the gap between academia and industry. And you're the man on the ground for this. Um, could you talk about the problems that this sort of framework aims to solve? Yes, absolutely. I think there's there's still today there's there's a funding gap for for true translational projects which are already originating from from academia, um, which are um, clearly have a drug development focus, but they are too early to pick, be picked up either by one of the pharma partners or by a conventional venture capitalist. So, so we were seeking to bridge this funding gap by uh, generating a fund that will explicitly focus um, uh, on, on projects which are coming out of Oxford University. And it's, it's a very exciting initiative. I'm, I'm really excited to, to be part of it as we are, as Oxford is the number one worldwide company in biomedical research. Now, what we like to do is we like to, to identify and then fund the projects which have the potential to become uh, superior treatments for serious diseases. And we are doing this by, pro, by, 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 by funding individual projects um, to, to do the critical experiment to generate preclinical proof of concept. And the other interesting part here is that the trajectory of this partnership is to generate um, to generate new companies coming out of it. So we have, do, do have a pre-agreed framework among the different um, partners in, in Lab 282, which is Oxford University, it's Oxford University Innovations, it's Oxford Sciences Innovation, which is the largest regional focused VC fund in Europe, and it's Evotech. And we have a pre-agreed framework on how to, to valorize the, uh, the results which come out of this partnership. So. so to make it short, yes, we basically like to provide um, funding to, to bridge the value of death preclinically, if you will. I see. Um, so the value of death is huge, though. Why are there so few companies like Evotech? I think part of the, the answer could be that there's not that many companies who could be the technological validator of our academic projects. Because if, if you want to do that, you have to have a breadth of technological offerings which could address the breadth of projects which will come out of uh, an academic institution such as Oxford. So there may be only a small, a small number of companies worldwide who could do it. You mentioned earlier that Evotech has, well, today we have about 1,100 employees and we're one of the few, co few companies who can basically offer all technology platforms from target identification all the way to development candidate preclinically um, to advance projects in different therapeutic areas, which is another hallmark of, of the Lab 282 uh, um, initiative that we would like to, to, to uh, support projects across different therapeutic areas. I see. Um, so Lab 282 also works on an application basis, so individual labs will have to come to you with an application. Um, what do you look for in the companies that uh, you would eventually fund? I think there's a number of, 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 of criteria that have to be met to basically be awarded the grant. So the one hand side, it has to be the, uh, the innovation height of, of, an, uh, of, of the project. It has to address a true unmet medical need. Mm -hmm. It has to have the potential to turn into uh, a drug in a reasonable amount of time. So it has to be unique. It has to be the potential to be first in class. Or it has to be the potential to be best in class. Mm -hmm. um, it has to fit, um, second most important thing, uh, or maybe the first most important thing is that the team has to be ready to have some entrepreneurial um, uh, spirit in it. So, that, so uh, the investigator has to be willing to to uh, to drive this into into a new company. Mm -hmm. uh, and third, certainly, I think there's uh, uh, there's a certain uh, administrative framework. So the, the the applicant has to come out of uh, Oxford University. Other than that, we're very open. We're very open in investing into projects across different therapeutic areas, across different therapeutic modalities to make sure we can pick the most excellent projects out of each individual area. Okay. Um, so, but given that a lot of academic scientists are terribly equipped to uh, become entrepreneurs, do you have any advice for them or anyone who's looking to start their company? 
Well, with the people I've talked so far at Oxford University, I, I've been surprised about the degree of entrepreneurial spirit that, that comes across. But this is, I think, also some, something like a hallmark, uh, being, at, at, uh, being an investigator at, as, as, at a comp as a university such as Oxford. Um, I would say more generally, I see more uh, a reservedness of, of, uh, um, of, of professors in, 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 in France, probably, in Germany, certainly to basically uh, uh, to dare the step out of a very comfortable academic environment. Um, I think my piece of advice is be a little bit more daring, think a little bit more translational, think a little bit more how you could, um, you could, could uh, apply your new therapeutic thinking uh, into generating a, a real drug. I think there's, there's uh, gonna be hopefully an increasing number of initiatives also outside of the UK that will support such activities. Um, and and it's, it's, it's applying a little more to the spirit of, of, of you know, trying to, to do true drug development for each, for each professor and think a little bit out of your comfort zone, if you will, and, and, and do dare to, to, to think translationally. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so following on that, um, do you have any favorite success stories of companies or biotech companies in Europe uh, besides Actelian? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat that um, again? But do you have any uh, favorite success stories of biotech companies in Europe besides Actelian? Or well, well, I think there's, do I have a personal success story? Um, no, not really. I think there's various business models that could lead to success. I mean, you have to be focused, you have to know your area. Uh, you have to be diligent and, and you basically have to be ready to hang in, uh, in, 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 your, in your area f for quite a while because we do know that clinical success rates are limited and you have to be willing to give uh, your therapeutic approach uh, maybe also a second try, if you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think everybody who is willing to invest long term into this, and certainly something that also uh, is, is what Evotech is thinking about, um, that I think is, is, is probably my, uh, my preference if you think about how you can generate success. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that there's anything missing from the ecosystem to make that happen? or to generate more successes? Well, I think we're with an initiative like as Lab 22, we're trying to fill one of the gaps which are there. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, I think there's, there, there are other factors that have to, to basically be factored into this as well. I think the, uh, um, the VC uh, landscape has to continue to, to be willing to invest and to, to, to invest uh, um, over a certain period of time. Um, I think regulators are starting to think more creatively if, if basically think about uh, how clinical trials uh, can be designed that, that lead to approval. So I think there, there's, there's uh, a number of factors along the value chain that have to fall into place uh, to, to, to ensure that there will be continued uh, biotech success stories. Okay. Um, great. Uh, that's all the questions that I have for you. Um, how about from the audience? Um, anyone questions? We have about Four or five minutes. Um, really, no questions. Surely. Okay, great. <laughs> Hans. Um, uh, oh, no, there's people coming. <laughs> Thank you. It's a question for Thomas um, um, about Evotech as an investor. Um, you're competing, of course, with uh, other investors in the space. What is uh, Evotech's uh, uh, horizon uh, and how is its approach different than the classical VC? Um, I think on the one hand side, we, we are not a financial investor, just to make this really clear, we are a strategic investor. And, and we initially like to invest into, um, into, into companies where I think uh, technologically or scientifically we can make a difference. And this has been the past of, of our investments, which we've done in the last 18 months, and maybe Topaz Therapeutic, uh, being a prime example of this, it was a, uh, an opportunity that came to us through our network and, and we felt that it's, it's a fantastic uh, therapeutic concept, but it didn't really fit uh, Evotech's core capabilities uh, in, you know, in optimizing small molecule drugs, for example. This is a nanoparticle technology, still a very exciting concept. So, so basically we, we decided to, to externalize it. And we were doing similar things with companies like Panion in the UK. So, so, so we are um, we are uh, really uh, doing this on a strategic basis to see where, what is complementary to our capabilities. Um, so secondarily, I think we, uh, we may be able to, to, willing to go a little bit earlier than a con conventional VC, if you will, 
taking a little more risk, but only in our sweet spot of, of competencies uh, to make sure we have a risk balance profile as well. Um, other questions? Um, uh oh, let's see. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> Well, a follow up. I mean, what what is your stake in the strategic investment? I mean, what do you get out of it? I mean, how how does that work, royalty wise or return wise for EvoTech? In in our company investments, basically, we do we do take some equity stake. So, um, in with regard to projects where we participate, which we have already partnered one of one of the major pharma companies, I think we do take. Um, um, I'd say um, returns pretty much like as for conventional licensing deals. So we basically, typically, if we partner one of our preclinical assets to one of the major pharma companies, we will basically um, participate in, 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 in the different inflection points uh, along the value chain, um, including milestones, royalties, etc. cetera. Um, oftentimes, we also like to structure deals such that we continue to be involved and uh, we're going to get some returns for the, for the work we do on the project. Uh, in other words, we get FTE payments, for example. Um, are there any other? OK. Uh, other, Hans? Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, my name is also Hans. Um, could you elaborate a bit on your core competences? Uh, are there specific diseases, or what is it actually you do? Yeah. So, so, so EvoTech's core competence is certainly technologically. We've basically been, uh, we, we started off as a company that's done a lot of high content, high throughput screening. Uh, we focused exclusively on preclinical drug development. We, are, we have a core strength in small molecule design and uh, advancement. We have uh, a growing capabilities also in monoclonal antibodies at this point in time. But our sweet spot is really from target identification to preclinical development candidate, over which we offer basically all services. Uh, we, we have a very strong MedCom team. We, we have just about announced that we're going to acquire Cyprotex so we can strengthen our capabilities in Admi Talks to, go to take the projects a little bit further down the value chain. Um, but other than that, our sweet spot is, is really the preclinical development space. And, and we, 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 we offer much more than doing uh, high throughput screening and medicinal chemistry. Basically, we have metabolomics, proteomics in place. So, so I would say every aspect of, of preclinical development, we, we do have our offerings in. OK, so um, that's about all we have time for. Um, let's all thank Thomas for telling us about EvoTech. Thank you. And, thank you. And I have a little gift for you if you memorize oh. this. This is the box of projects that could be in Oxford, could be anywhere. Pick oh. the right pill if you're in drug development. You must work on. Oh, great. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you.